Okay, then um, Megan Thomas is a watchable wildlife biologist with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. She is a Maryland native with a dual BS degree, one in organismal, organismal biology and ecology and one in animal behavior. She obtained her MS degree in biology from Eastern Illinois University, where she studied snake dietary ecology for her thesis. Megan has a passion for connecting people to nature and fostering an appreciation for wildlife and habitat conservation. When she's not working, she enjoys time exploring the outdoors with her fiance and her two dogs. And she's going to talk with us about the, among, among other things, about the Adopt-A-Trail project that's underway for the Virginia Master Naturalist to partner with. So thank you, Megan. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let me just make sure I got my screen share set up here. Okay, everyone should be seeing my screen, correct? Yep. Thumbs up if you can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, let me just minimize this here. Okay, well, thank you guys so much for coming to listen to me talk about the Watchable Wildlife Program tonight. Um, as you guys just heard, I'm one. Of, I'm a watchable wildlife biologist with the the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, and I'm actually one of two watchable wildlife biologists that we have here at this uh, within the state. Um, and I have to say, I absolutely love my job. <laughs> I feel very, very fortunate to get to do all of the things I, I get to do every single day, and I really love talking about it. Um, so I'm so excited to have this opportunity to touch base with everybody here, and. Um, especially with the, the Master Naturalist chapters. I, I'm an advisor to a Master Naturalist chapter on the coast, um, and it's one of my favorite things that I get to do. So I'm very with you guys whenever I can. Um, so the goal for my presentation tonight, I've kind of melded together two presentations that I typically give. One of them is about the Adopt-A-Trail program, which um, I've heard that your chapter is interested in and, and potentially considering um, getting involved in. And then the other is uh, just more general information about our Watchable Wildlife Program at DWR. Because um, we have a, a great variety of resources that myself and our other Watchable Wildlife Biologist, Jessica, develop um, that, that you guys as Master Naturalists can tap into. So hopefully you'll get to, you'll get to see more of those opportunities here. So I'm just going to go through really quickly a, a quick introduction to DWR and the Watchable Wildlife Program, and then we'll hit on those individual program components, the, the Bird and Wildlife Trail and, and Adopt a Trail really being my primary focus. It, um, and then after that, I, I definitely want to talk to you guys about our wildlife viewing cameras, because this is a new uh, thing that's growing within the agency. And then at the very end, I will open it up for any questions. So. If anybody does have any questions that, that you think of while I'm in the middle of presenting, uh, feel free to just type it into the chat. And then after the presentation, I will be happy to revisit any questions if I am lucky enough to get any. <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned, I work for Virginia Department of Wildlife Forces, formerly known as the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, which I'm sure is what many of you uh, uh, know and associate the agency with that, that former name. And one thing I get asked about all of the time is why it is that our name changed in, in this past year. It'll, it'll be a year in July, I believe. Um, and a big part of that comes into play when you think about our mission as a state agency. So we are the, the agency in Virginia that's charged with conservation and management of wildlife and habitat populations. And we also have this duty to be connecting people to the outdoors through a variety of different opportunities. Uh, those include boating and education, fishing, hunting, trapping, and my personal favorites, wildlife viewing and other wildlife related activities. And then of course, we, we also have this uh, obligation to be protecting people and property by promotion of these safe outdoor experiences. Um, and the one thing I really wanna point out here, hopefully you guys can see my mouse moving around, um, is that number one, obviously our mission is, is very conservation forward, but this, uh, we're, we're all about managing wildlife populations. It's not managing game populations or inland fisheries populations, it's wildlife and it's habitat. Um, we care just as much about our non-game species as, as we do our game species. And the same thing with the constituents. So um, unfortunately our old name just didn't do a very good job of connecting us with all of our many priorities. Um, 
So hopefully this new name will do a better job of forging that association in the next generation of outdoor enthusiasts' minds. <laughs> okay, so that's a really good segue into our Watchable Wildlife program. Because as an agency, we really do recognize that groups like wildlife viewers often think about and value wildlife in, in a totally different way than, you know, traditional hunting and angling constituents do. And honestly, that goes for, for me, even as a, a, as a wildlife biologist or, or agency staff. Um, I know for a fact that I think about and value and interact with wildlife very, very differently than my other wildlife biologist colleagues who are more involved with game management and, and working to ensure that we have, you know, proper amounts of, of hunting opportunity across the state. Um, but so that's really what the, what the program was started for about 20 years ago. It was designed to increase support for wildlife conservation and really make, making, making sure that we had a, a way to facilitate these non-consumptive, so non-hunting, non-angling, non-trapping uh, forms of wildlife recreation. And we do that in a variety of different ways. We're constantly promoting and providing opportunities for wildlife viewing. So we'll definitely talk about that more uh, in, in the next couple of slides. But we also are, are um, working really hard to increase awareness and, and just foster a general appreciation for wildlife or darters or herps, which are my personal favorite, reptiles and amphibians, and of course, birds and mammals and, and all of that too. Um, and then finally, we work very hard to foster stewardship by just promoting really, really easy conservation actions that folks can take all across the state, no matter what region you're in, whether you're in a rural area or an urban setting, um, there are easy things that everyone can do to, uh, you know, get involved with wildlife viewing. So we work really hard to connect those folks to those opportunities. And this is just a smattering of some of the different um, resources we've developed, programs we've developed, campaigns we've developed in, in the past 20 years or so. Um, and some of them we have been responsible for in, in entirely at the agency level, like the Bird and Wildlife Trail or our wildlife viewing cameras. But really the vast majority of things are things that we have partnered with other really amazing and great opera or organizations like the Master Naturalist or the Bluebird Society on. Uh, wildlife mapping is another one that, that we run, um, that we've worked with a lot of other agency partners on. So um, it's all a collaborative effort and we're very fortunate to have a lot of great partners working with us on many of these things. <laughs> so with that in mind, I'm gonna move on to the Bird and Wildlife Trail. Now, the Bird and Wildlife Trail is definitely one of the most fundamental components of our Watchable Wildlife Program. Uh, it was created about 20 years ago uh, but despite being around for such a long time, there's a lot of people across Virginia that don't actually know it exists. So I really do want to spend some time uh, talking about it this evening. So the Virginia Bird and Wildlife Trail, or VBWT, you might see that abbreviation at some point in my slides, is an organized network of outdoor sites that highlight the best places in the state to see birds and wildlife in the Commonwealth. Um, it's not actually a connected trail like the Appalachian Trail or the PCT where you start at one point and, and you hike this organized trail uh, all the way to an end point. It's really more of this connected network of all of these different outdoor sites that, that you can go to see wildlife. Um, Virginia has an amazing amount of wildlife viewing opportunities. I mean, we've got over 400 species of birds, 150 plus species of reptiles and amphibians. Uh, oh, I just slipped ahead of the slide, sorry. <laughs> um, 150 plus species of reptiles and amphibians and, and hundreds and hundreds more of, you know, butterflies and dragonflies and fish and all kinds of other really, really amazing wildlife. So we really are a premier state for wildlife viewing. And, and that's really where the desire to create the Bird and Wildlife Trail all those years ago came from. Um, so like I said, it, 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 it's been around for a while now. It work started on it in 1999 and then um, it was completed in sections. So we worked on it one region at a time, mountains, Piedmont and coast. The coast was the last section to be finalized in the early 2000s. So that's the first level of organization that we have is, is that regional level of, of site organization. So this is a map of our current bird and wildlife trail sites that you see on the screen here. The sites that are triangle shaped, those represent mountain sites. 
whereas circle shapes represent Piedmont sites and then squares are our coastal sites. So this regional level organization just helps, you know, break it down and make it a little bit more user friendly for those that are using the guide. Um, and then we have this additional level of organization, which are called loops. So uh, each loop here on the map is represented by a different colored shape. So for example, here is um, our star city loop uh, is, is these green triangles. And then uh, Roanoke Valley is this light pink triangle here. Um, yeah, so each color and shape represents a different loop. So at this point, we actually have 65 different loops all across the state. Uh, and, and it's another way that, like I said, it, it makes it a little bit easier for folks if they're looking for sites to go uh, spend some time birding or, or wildlife viewing, they can really easily find sites in their area. Or there's other people who, um, who they really like to drive sites one to one or like go from one site to the next basically. So um, for those individuals, we also provide driving directions. So you can really easily map your routes out to go explore different areas of the state. And the other thing about the Bird and Wildlife Trail, at, at its current state, it's made up of over 640 sites. So it is an absolutely massive entity for our Watchable Wildlife Program to manage, especially when you consider this is just one facet of our Watchable Wildlife Program. Um, and both of our Watchable Wildlife Biologists are located on the coast. So uh, as you can imagine, keeping up with it has been very tough uh, throughout the years. You know, site owners change and, and roads change and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but despite that, we haven't really wanted to do these massive calling efforts of, of all of these sites because it's so, so important to us that we have this really, really high site diversity all across the state. Um, you know, because when it comes to wildlife viewing, everybody seems to have different preferences for, for what they like in a site. There are definitely people who like to, to visit the state park, uh, and there's also local parks, you know, county and city level parks that we've got included. We've got national parks, we've got wildlife refuges, national wildlife refuges. We have state wildlife management areas for folks who like a little bit more rugged of an experience, you know, they want to be able to really go off the beaten trail. Uh, there's tons of folks who love to view by boat. So we've got kayak and canoe launches. We've got quite a few sites that, that do this amazing job blending historic interpretive information with wildlife viewing interpretive information, you know. So uh, Jamestown Island near me is a really great example of that. You can visit Jamestown and learn all about the history of that location. And, and there's also some really fantastic wildlife viewing opportunities. Um, so all of that is just to say that it is a lot of sites, but we feel like it's really, really important to, to have this diverse array of sites. Um, we don't want it to just be a map of, you know, state parks and national wildlife refuges. But that just means that, that it's a lot for us to maintain. And that's where the adopt -a trail program comes in, which we're getting to. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Bird and Wildlife Trail, maybe seeing these pictures will help jog your memory a little bit because these signs are everywhere, um, especially all along the roads and everything like that. We have, uh, we've got two different types of signs that are out right now. There are site entrance signs, which are small signs like the one you see here that mark the entrance of a site. And then there are um, larger road signs with, with arrows that point the in the when those signs are installed, my predecessors in my position didn't do a very good job thinking about where they were putting the signs. And, and what we found is that throughout the years, they've really just caused a lot more confusion than anything else um, because they're only on main roads. They're not on, on side roads that you would need to take. So we would really like to do away with these signs altogether. Um, you know, in addition to being kind of confusing, they're, they're also very out of date. They have an old name and old logo. Uh, so we're really hoping to be able to update these signs in the near future, um, which is something we would be working with our, our adopted trail partners on if, if we end up getting the funding for all of these new signs. <laughs> um, the other thing about the Bird and Wildlife Trail, a, a big change that has been made in the past couple of years, when the, when the Bird and Wildlife Trail first came out, um, it was launched and then simultaneous to the Bird and Wildlife Trail as an entity opening up, uh, we also released this series of Bird and Wildlife Trail guides. 
So we had three guides. There was one for each region, so Piedmont, Mountain, and Coast. Um, and it basically had all the information that you would need to use the Bird and Wildlife Trail. It had site names, site descriptions, along with what species you were likely to encounter at individual sites. It had recommendations for close by amenities if you were traveling, drive instructions, were, they were pretty big books. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately they did sell out really, really quickly. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we found that that they were very, very difficult to update, uh, as you might expect, because this is a printed book. I mean, it's not even a magazine or anything like that. It's a it's a spiral book. Um, and so, you know, within even just a couple of years of the Bird and Wildlife Trail launching, we had things like site owners changing and, and roads changing, all of that stuff I've kind of already talked to you about a little bit. Uh, and, and these guys are really, really expensive to produce. So we're likely never going to be revisiting a printed guide, at least not one as hardy as a, a hardback book, just because it's impossible to constantly keep up to date. Um, but what we have done is we've moved the guide online. So we now have a, a version of it on DWR's website, which contains all of that exact same information. And then we even have a corresponding app that you can use. And this is also a website as well. So you could use either one of these to, to access that information. Um, so I think I've done hopefully a decent enough job explaining the Bird and Wildlife Trail to you guys and kind of setting up what some of the, the headaches have been in, in the most recent years that we've been encountering. Um, and it's really from those headaches that we got the idea to start collaborating with the State Master Naturalist Office on the creation of the Adopt a Trail project to kind of tackle two different goals. Number one, we obviously want to do updating and improving that guide information. Um, for so many of these sites, they just haven't been looked at in, in many, many years. And who better to do that than the people who are really invested in their natural spaces uh, in, in those same counties and cities. Um, but the other goal that we really wanted to accomplish here was we, we wanted to have this way to be connecting master naturalists with local site owners in the area. Um, the state office was finding that they were getting lots and lots of requests from new master naturalist chapters, wanting more resources about how they could start launching projects, especially newly developed chapters. You know, they, they wanted more guidelines to be able to start launching projects and finding areas in their region, you know, where, where stewardship projects were needed. And so the adopt -a trail project kind of became this, this melded way to address both of those needs. Um, so basically the way it works is uh, chapters would go out and they would visit the sites along the Bird and Wildlife Trail. Uh, typically it's done seasonally. You do a, a once a year more detailed initial evaluation of a site where you would be updating or reporting back to us about the information that's on the guide. So the site description, the species that are there, um, driving direction, give it reporting that stuff back to us but uh, then the the other times that you're out visiting the site because it, it's typically done seasonally that did learning and submitting observations in e as well as wildlife mapping and submitting observations into iNaturalist and those elements especially are so so important um oh I'm getting a notification that my internet connection is unstable I'm hoping you guys can still hear me and I haven't for us <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to just keep going, but if somebody start talking, if, if I freeze, okay. <laughs> you just been uh, um, breaking up a little bit, but mostly you've been here the whole time. <laughs> okay. Let me know if it gets bad and I can try to, to switch my internet connection, but, but we'll keep going. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the, the birding and the wildlife mapping, that has been one that the feedback we've gotten from site owners has been outstanding. Um, they really, really love getting these adopted trail folks out and visiting sites because number one, you know, you just get individuals out and visiting local sites in, in your area, which at a time when we have so many forests and, and habitat loss happening, it's so important to be visiting and frequenting our local natural spaces. Um, so that's so important. And then of course, generating these lists of wildlife observations at sites are great too, because um, you know, if you see something really, really cool at a site, um, you know, then other folks can see it and potentially want to go to that site. 
or for folks who are new to things like birding, um, I can tell you the new birders, they don't wanna to go to a brand new site that doesn't have a lot of eBird observations. They wanna to go to a site where they see lots of eBird observations. So having uh, these seasonal visits is, is really helpful in that areas too, or in those areas also. Um, so the project, it seems like has been really, really popular amongst chapters that like stewardship projects because it's kind of been this springboard into the chapter developing project for the site, um, you know, trash pickups, invasive species removal. Some of them have designed trail maps that they have, um, that, that they've designed for the sites that then they just print out on computer paper, the trail maps, and they give them to the site uh, that people can pick up and use. Others like this, uh, this gentleman from the Northern Neck chapter, he even developed a full on new trail that he worked with them on. So it's really been this, this amazing opportunity to springboard in some stewardship opportunities in your area. And then of course the birding and wildlife mapping, I, I talked about that. Um, and just people who wanna get to know more sites in their area. So um, with that in mind, just to put it on everybody's radar, um, you guys have two loops. There's even possibly a third one, um, but, but two definitely that, that are in your area um, that haven't ever been adopted. So I'm sure that they need a lot of sprucing up which is the lower New River Loop and the Eastern Continental Divide Loop. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, and now what I'll do is I will show you how to go about actually navigating that guide. And I will show you the difference in a loop that has been adopted by a chapter relative to one that hasn't been. So um, really quickly, this is the main bird and wildlife trail guide page here. Uh, you can get here by just Googling Virginia Bird and Wildlife Trail, or if you click on wildlife viewing, it will take it on, on our homepage. It takes you right there also. Um, so here's our regional breakdown. I'm going to show you coast just because my favorite example is, is on the coast. I know you guys are in the mountains though. Um, so one of our, our oldest, our, our chapter that has participated in the project the longest is the Eastern Shore Loop. Uh, so this is a this is a map of all the different loops in the coastal region. Then you can click on Eastern Shore, which is that this one right here. I really want to focus in on. Um, and you can see we've got these nice pictures of oyster catchers up here. We've got an updated map. We've got a really nice description. And then uh, these are our individual sites on this loop. They correspond to the the loop map here. Um, Here's one of my absolute favorite sites, which is the Eastern Shore of Virginia National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's got this really, really nice header photo. There's a great description here that calls out some of the really, really cool species that you could find like kestrels and ospreys, merlin, heron and falcons. There's this mention of these seasonal guided tours that happen. Um, and then we've got these up-to-date directions. Uh, so, so that's kind of the site information, the more detailed site information. But then we also have this facilities checklist. And um, one of my favorite features is this 10 most recent bird observations added to eBird. So these change uh, lives. So if I just made a bird observation at this hotspot right now, it would, it would update this. So I'm really interested in this tricolored heron myself. Um, <laughs> and of course there's site contact information. We've got this ability to view on Google Maps. So if you're on a smartphone, you could just plug right in uh, where you want to go. And then uh, we also have the ability to do a more detailed breakdown of the eBird data. My internet is taking a long time now. Um, yeah, so you can do a more detailed breakdown of the eBird data. So uh, you can change the date range. This is all the eBird observations that this site has ever. Um, but yeah, you can you can look at date ranges. You can look at different species and and when people are seeing them uh, at, at this particular site. So this eBird data is really going a long way in helping folks plan their trips. Um, there's a lot of people who are trying to hit every single bird and wildlife trail site in the state, um, and they're doing a lot of it based on, on this eBird data. So um, that's just another, another way the data that's collected from Adopted Trail is, is being used. So um, yeah, this is, like I said, this is a pretty stellar example of, of a site. Um, I like this picture. It's really, really got a great description. 
Now what I'm going to do is show you a site that has not been adopted, um, that we have not had the chance to do any type of updating yet. And that is this Prince William loop right here. So you can see our loop map is really old. This description is probably not the most up to date. Um, here's our sites on this loop. There's no picture. The description is pretty basic. The directions are really basic. Now this one actually has facilities, which is an upgrade, but you can see there's none of, there's nobody birding the site. That hasn't happened recently. Um, I'm sure there's probably gonna be some seasonal operations just because it, it would be of all time, but it's really bare bones compared to that Eastern shore site. Um, and, and really the only way we were able to get that Eastern shore site to where it's at is through the adoptive trail volunteers visiting it. Like I said, they're the ones who are able to let us know when there's a really cool new feature that's developed at a site, like a new pollinator garden has been installed, then we can include that in the description. Um, there are many chapters that have really amazing, talented photographers. They are the ones who provide the photos that we set up here. So it's a way that you guys could have your own photos up there. Um, we do all the behind the scenes website editing stuff. You just fill out a data sheet basically and, and that gets us the edits that we need to make. Um, but yeah, so that is an example of what the project can accomplish. And then um, we'll go back here really quickly. Where to view wildlife, bird and wildlife trail. And the two loops that I just wanted to, I mentioned to you guys, we're in the middle of updating this map right now. So the, the layout's a little bit wonky, unfortunately, but um, Lower New River was one of them. And I was looking at this loop a little bit earlier and I'm actually really excited about this one because it has, it's made up, uh, there's so many riverway trails. So it looks like there's a lot of, um, kayaking and paddling and floating opportunity. So if you guys have uh, members in your chapter that really like to kayak uh, and, and bird and all of that, this would be a great loop to take on. Um, and I personally am really trying to expand our aquatic wildlife viewing opportunities. Um, my fiance is a fisheries biologist for DWR and I personally have a fascination with darters. I, I absolutely love them. <laughs> we have a lot of really cool stream wildlife viewing opportunities. Um, and this is a, a really, really cool loop that I would love to do a little bit more um, enhancing in that particular area. So that's Lower New River. And then the other one, Eastern Continental Divide, this one also needs some work. So here's the sites that are on it right now. Um, some of you guys may even be familiar with some of these sites already. Um, but yeah, those are, those are the two loops. So let me get back to my PowerPoint here now. Okay. So, um, I've shown you what we've accomplished with the, the guide, but we, we also the kind of the, the bragging feature here, we now have over 50% of our master naturalist chapters, um, participating in the, in the program. And that means that we've gotten nearly 50% of our bird and wildlife trail loops adopted. So we've really come a long way. Um, we've been able to update the data and the maps. Really, most importantly, is, is this ability to remove these sites that are not of the quality that we would like them to be. Um, and then we've had we've added so many new sites based on master naturalist recommendations. You know, typically they get in there, they adopt a loop, and then they let me know about like five sites on the loop that are defunct or just not good quality. So we cut those, and then they clue us into where all the much better local sites are in the area um, that should be included in place of them. So um, that has been so so helpful at really just revamping things from an overall loop perspective, getting rid of those old sites and, and adding the new ones that you guys propose to us. Uh, we've also made a lot of marketing updates uh, based on your feedback. I'll show you some of those in a second. And um, we're working on even more updates and new features currently under development. Like uh, we're trying to get a best bets feature out there where say I wanted to go see hawks. Um, I could put in hawks as my best bet species and it would show me all the sites where I would have the best bets at seeing hawks. <laughs> so that's coming. Um, I mentioned the marketing that we do. This is one way that we kind of give back to those sites a little bit. We pay for all of these promotional materials about the Bird and Wildlife Trail. Um, and we distribute the state um, visitor centers, welcome centers, 
we pay for this Virginia travel guide advertisement. So that's another way we can kind of get folks going to these local sites. And then we also have a series of regional brochures that we put out. Um, we do not have one for the Blacksburg area yet, but we're about to launch one for the Charlottesville region. And um, these brochures highlight those sites, but, but not every single site in an area, they're really the best of the best um, are what we put in the brochures because obviously we don't have room for every single site. Um, and so this is the feedback, especially too, where the master naturalists really come in handy because you guys are really able to work with us and give us guidance on what sites should be included in the brochures and which ones um, aren't worth including. So those are all of the different brochures. Um, the other thing is we have the opportunity to provide our um, bird and wildlife trail sites with grants every year. Um, it's our, our uh, localities grant program for the bird and wildlife trail. So any site on the bird and wildlife trail is eligible for this, whether it's a wildlife refuge park, um, and basically it, it allows us to provide funding to some localities that need some amenities upgrades. So interpretive signage or the installation of kiosks or trails, um, really anything that's gonna create a better, more enjoyable wildlife viewing experience. Um, we, we, can, we try to offer those funds to folks. Um, and this is another part where the, the adopt a trail program comes in because the adopt a trail uh, volunteers serve as amazing conduits between this program and the site owners. Um, they are really, really great at working with site owners and just letting them know about this program and then working with them on the development of a grant application and then getting involved with the implementation of it. Like I mentioned, the, um, the chapter that, that designed the, the trail maps earlier. Um, so that's just another way to kind of springboard yourself into some more stewardship opportunities if, if that's something your chapter likes to do. Um, and then of course, we also have our larger Virginia Wildlife Grant Program. So um, this is an agency-wide program, but wildlife viewing has been our most popular, uh, our, our, we find more wildlife viewing projects than anything else. So the money all comes from any shop DWR purchases and, do and donations from businesses and private donors. So any money, like if you were to go and buy a shirt or a mug or someone a gift from the DWR store, all of that money goes into our wildlife grant program, which is geared at getting kids outdoors, whether it's for wildlife viewing or for hunting, um, you know, any way that kids can get outdoors, those are the projects we fund with this wildlife grant program. Um, so these are just some examples of, of ones we have funded recently. This is a great one that I worked with. Um, I worked with the, this library uh, group on the development of these early birder backpacks, um, which you can now check out at the library. Um, so yeah, if you guys happen to know of, um, of any schools or nonprofits or, or government agencies that are looking for funding to get kids in the outdoors, definitely send them this way. Okay. I'm gonna switch gears now um, and move away from the bird and wildlife trail and talk about our wildlife viewing cameras. This is another really, really big program within the, the watchable wildlife uh, uh, department. And we're growing it a little bit more. So our most popular camera is the Richmond Falcon Cam. So this is a, a live streaming peregrine falcon nest. The nest box and the camera are both located in downtown Richmond atop the Riverfront Plaza building on the, the 21st story. Um, and it's on the West Tower, which is this tower here. And it's like sits right in this little corner. Um, this is a catwalk all around the building. So the nest box and the camera are there. And the camera runs from March 1st through July. So it's currently active right now. Um, and and it, you could go to that link and you could see a live stream of, of Peregrine Falcons. Um, this is one of my favorite things that I get to work on because it's a really, really good melding of really good on the ground conservation work just melded so perfectly with a lot of education and appreciation elements that, that we can twist in there. Um, so we're working with schools to incorporate uh, the Richmond Falcon Cam into some of their school curriculum. And then I also have an educational blog that people will subscribe to. We've got over 5,000 subscribers to that right now. Um, so I put out blog posts that I basically break down the, the different behaviors that folks see on camera. Um, hair bonding, courtship, breeding, incubation, chick rearing, all the drama that surrounded downtown environment. Um, 
And then we're also even able to answer some of our own research questions. One that I'm currently looking at is, uh, you know, literature for peregrine falcons indicates that the females spend the vast majority of time on the incubating the eggs um, on the nest, but our particular male has, uh, he's spending a lot of time. So we're trying to go back and revisit um, that old assumption and, and just keep track of how much time the males are actually spending incubating. And then we have some, some other volunteer opportunities like fledge watch events when, when the chicks do fledge. Fledging enrichment is very, very dangerous. <laughs> um, there's lots of buildings as, as they're working on landing um, or flying. Landing is typically the most difficult thing for a fledgling peregrine falcon to be able to, um, get, those, to get those skills. Um, so unfortunately we have several incidences where fledglings will run into buildings. And this is where the fledge watch event is really, really important. We work with local volunteers and master naturalists bring our spotting scope and let's keep track of where the chicks are. Um, so if something does happen, um, we can get them to a, a rehabber. It's a level of intervention that we don't typically do, but because this is a state endangered species, um, we're a little bit more involved, you know, intervening when needed. Um, and then we're also reestablishing populations in the native range. So um, some of the chicks that are produced here are going on and being hacked out in the mountains because we're really, really trying to get more peregrines out in the mountains. Um, and as of 2019, the pair that was is here in, in Richmond is actually one of only 31 pairs in the state. So they're pretty special. Um, so here's a look at what the camera looks like and what the nest box looks like. You can see the camera here, and this is that little catwalk ledge with the nest box. We were we were up here because this piece of wood removed or fell down, so we needed to remove that, obviously. Um, but it's it's pretty it's it's something. I mean, you're really really high up, so it's not anything for anybody who is afraid of heights. And um, I work on it with our non-game bird conservation biologist Sergio Harding. This is the two of us getting ready to go out on the ledge. Uh, so you can see we need to wear harnesses, we need to wear hard hats, and we need to bring this broom with us because the birds, especially at nesting, are so, so territorial. Um, they really want to dive bomb you, hence the, the hard hats. And one of us at all times has to hold the broom high up in the air because they swoop down and they'll hit the top of the broom as opposed to our heads. Um, and the harnesses also, you know, we clip in so that if, if we were to be hit, um, we won't fall off the ledge. So that's all the safety gear that, that we need to wear when we're working out on the ledge with the nest box. And honestly, this falcon cam, it's, it's been around since 2003, and it has been quite the saga um, throughout the years. Between 2003 and 2016, we had one stable pair, a male and a female. Um, you know, throughout that span of time, they, they ended up producing 61 eggs, of which 59% of those hatched, and 31 chicks survived to flight, or flight age. Um, so they had a really, really long run. Unfortunately, 2016 was the last year we saw the female falcon, but she was unbanded. So we don't know exactly how old she was. Um, so, you know, having spent that many years at the site already, she was probably at the end of her natural lifespan. Um, so then in 2017, that same male from, from that we've had all of these years, he was unofficially named Ozzy. He returned in 2017 and he paired with a, a new female for the first time in falcon cam history. So they went on to produce three eggs, all of which hatched, and um, two of them actually fledged, and, and one was later spotted in New Jersey that same year. So these are photos of that fledgling in New Jersey in October, uh, after he had just fledged a couple months earlier in July. Unfortunately, in 2018, the male returns, but that 2017 female he paired with last year, she ended up never showing up on camera, and we later found out she was documented raising a brood uh, down in Yorktown with another male. So she was gone. There weren't any eggs laid in Richmond that year. Um, and unfortunately, that was the last year we saw the male on camera as well. At, at this point, he was very, very old. So it's safe to presume that that, that was just the end of his natural lifespan. Um, so once we got to 2019, uh, the game really changed for us. We had a uh, we didn't have a stable male. We didn't have a stable female. Um, and, and when it comes to peregrine falcons, there's a lot of territorial disputes that happen for, for proper breeding sites. There's not that many across the state. So we were optimistic that we would get another male and another female in place of our, our old pair. Um, we did have one new male show up 
We were able to tell by his bands that he was from Dumfries, Virginia. I think he was hatched in 2016. And then he had uh, this Buffy female that showed up. They were courting, all was good. We were, that they were gonna go and, and lay eggs. Um, but then several other females started showing up and, um, and, and they were kind of duking it out for which female was gonna get the rights to this nesting site. And the one that actually ended up sticking around the rest of the season, oh, sorry, that's the other male and the female and the, they're participating in pair bonding behaviors. But the female that ended up sticking around was actually a second year female. So she wasn't even reproductively mature and she was able to oust these other females. Um, so she's really, really tough. She was banded. We were able to see that she was from Delaware. She was hatched on a bridge in Delaware in um, 2018, I believe it was. So she stuck around with this male the whole season. She successfully defended her territory. Um, they never did produce a clutch of eggs that year, but it's likely because she was so young still. Um, so that was a 2019 drama. 2020, we were very happy to see that same banded male from Dumfries, Virginia return, um, as well as this unbanded Buffy female who we've seen now for two years in a row, but, but she's just never been able to hang on. Um, so they spent about a whole month on camera and there weren't any territorial disputes. So we were, we were very confident that, that, that once again, this pair would be the one um, to go on and, and lay a clutch of eggs this year. That's them again, pair bonding in the nest. Um, and then early one morning in March, I was watching the camera and I saw this. <laughs> um, so this is two female peregrine falcons in the middle of a, a territorial dispute over this nest box. Um, and you can see the sheer force when that one female flies in. And at one point the male even flies up. I think that's about to happen. The male flies up and lands right here on the ledge and the new female that wants to come in, she hits him and, and she doesn't even hit him, but just the force of her strike sends him flying back. Um, so they're incredibly powerful birds. This went on for several hours that morning, um, but by the end of it all, uh, that Buffy female was once again ousted from this site that she seems to want uh, so bad. And um, we had a, a newly established female on scene. Um, we were able to look at her bands and it turns out she was actually that same juvenile female from the year before, but she's now a year older. She's reproductively mature. She's lost that second year plumage. Um, so here's her getting to know the new male after she ousted that old female. They went on to lay four eggs. I was so, so happy. Uh, this was the first time we had had eggs in many years at this point. Um, they, one of the eggs hatched. So this is the chick right when it hatched in May. And this is just two hours later. You can see how much they, um, once they dry out, how much they really fluff up. So that's her and that chick. This is the chick at a week old, or not a week old. This was a couple weeks in. Um, this is the male here, 24 AU and the female, 95 AK. So they're uh, shifting out, caring for the chick. It's got this really, really nice full crop. So you can tell it's getting a lot of food. Um, this is a video. I love this. This is the, oh, this is the chick and the female. And this dragonfly comes in and just watch these two birds, their heads as they follow this dragonfly all around the nest box. It's just so funny to watch them. <laughs> So that's the chick and the female last year. Um, this was right before banding. The chick is now as large as the female is. At this point, we were pretty sure that was gonna be a female chick. The females are larger than males. Um, so we could tell by the size we were seeing on camera. Um, we, oh yeah, this is when she got more mobile. <laughs> we went up to collect her that day. This is me and Sergio. You can see the two parents circling overhead there. Um, so we grabbed her from the nest box and this is her getting bands. It, this was what confirmed she was a female, a, a larger band size than the male. Um, so yeah, she's getting banded here. She's not very happy about it, um, but that's her new jewelry she's got. Unfortunately, shortly after she was banded, she fledged a little too early. Um, I had to go down one weekend and, and look all over Richmond and find her um, because she, she took off much earlier than she should have. Um, and I put her back up on the ledge, but unfortunately she fledged early again after that. So ultimately this was a bird that was then moved to the mountains and she was placed in a hack box in the mountains and ultimately released in the Shenandoah um, National Forest. So 
I haven't heard anything about her since. Um, you know, sometimes that's just how it goes. I hope that she will end well. <laughs> um, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> she stuck around that site for several weeks um, before she ultimately took off. So, um, okay, so 2021, unfortunately, that, so now we're caught up to this year. <laughs> um, 2021, unfortunately, started off with some sad news that in, in early January, the mail from the past two years, that newer mail, uh, we ended up getting a call from Richmond Animal Control that uh, somebody had found him in the yard and he actually had completely severed one of his wings. So he needed to be euthanized. That was in January. The, the breeding season for peregrine falcons typically starts in February. So um, we turned the camera on, really hoping we'd get another male. Our female, 95 AK, she's right here. She, uh, she showed up on camera and very quickly we got evidence of a new male who was banded on camera. This is him right here. Um, and if you remember our timeline of events, I mentioned there was this one adult female um, who she, she produced those eggs in, uh, in 2017, the one that was spotted in New Jersey. Um, but then she went uh, and raised a, a brood at Yorktown and, and continued producing eggs in Yorktown. Well, this new male that we have on camera is actually the prodigy of, um, or um, the offspring of that female. So he has these ties back to Richmond. Um, now he was produced with the female in Yorktown and her new male. So he doesn't have any relation to the old male, but his mother one year nested in the same site that he is now the, the dominant Richmond male for. So that was super cool. Um, I also can see that I'm starting to run really short on my time. So I had a really cool um, video here that I wanted to show you guys. This was just some of those, these courtship behaviors that we've been able to document this year. Um, and so this was all mostly in February. So that's the male flying in. Um, he's an amazing hunter. We've had uh, more prey items delivered on camera from this male than we ever have had with any of the other males that have been in and out of this site. So there he just delivered some food to the female. Um, she runs off with it. <laughs> this is our female. And we had uh, several days of snow in Richmond in February, during which time the male really stayed locked into that, uh, that nest box. Here he is in the snow. Um, and at one point, he even gets in the snow and he really starts digging out the scrape, which is so funny. Um, so we've really been able to get a glimpse into peregrine falcon nesting. Um, that we have just never had before through this camera. I mean, like I said, it, it provides us this great way to do this educational stuff, but um, we've also learned so much about Peregrine Falcon natural history through, through this camera as well. Uh, so it's, it's really one of my favorite projects. Um, here's the two participating in a pair bonding display. They, they do this really fast bonding to start it. And here's the male, he's about to dig out the scrape uh, in the snow. <laughs> Yep. And that's a classic example of a behavior that we would have never seen um, without this camera. And here's him with a kill deer, one of his many prey items that he has been delivering to the box. He gifts those prey items to the female. And finally, this is one of my favorites. This was just a really windy day where he's trying to enjoy this starling. And um, first the wind rolls the starling's head off the ledge. So you have to imagine being 21 floors below and just walking down the sidewalk and, and that starling head just flops down and then the wind eventually even knocks him off. So um, anyways, these two have now gone on to produce a clutch of four eggs. They are currently incubating right now. So if you log onto the, the Falcon Cam website, you go to that website, you will certainly see a falcon on the nest. Um, and we are hoping to see a hatch between May 5th and May 7th. Hopefully um, we'll have more than just one chick this year. 
Um, and I'm gonna go really fast now. We also have an ELK cam, um, which allows folks to see our, um, our repatriated elk herd uh, out in the, the mountains. And this is another great one. I could talk to you guys, I could give a whole other presentation about coal field restoration and elk, um, but I won't. <laughs> um, we have a shad cam, which allows people to see the American shad run in Richmond. Um, we're working, it's still photos, but we're working on upgrading it. We're working on establishing a marsh camera to track tidal environments at one of our WMAs, Hog Island, which has some great, great birding opportunities. My favorite bird of all time, a roseate spoonbill, was uh, documented here a couple years ago. Um, we have uh, multiple festivals that we support. The closest one to you guys is, is probably the elk festival that we're involved in. Um, and then we of course have our Restore the Wild membership, which is a way for wildlife viewers to um, engage a little bit more with uh, the agency. You know, They don't buy a hunting or a fishing license, but they can buy our Restore the Wild membership. And then all the funds that, that those we get from the memberships go directly into habitat projects. So they're not funding staff or anything like that. Um, it goes into on the ground habitat work. So last year alone, we were able to do 180 acres just based on the funds that we received from Restore the Wild. Um, our pilot species for last year or the species we were really focused on was the rusty patched bumblebee, which is a federally endangered species. The year before that was red cockaded woodpeckers. And this year we're doing Virginia's imperiled turtles, which I really, really especially love because I'm a herpetologist by nature. <laughs> um, and we this really cool Restore the Wild art competition this year. This was the first year we'd ever done this. We ended up getting 28 amazing entries into this artwork competition. Um, so this is just a handful of the ones that I really love. This was the one that was selected um, to be the winner, but all of these other ones, I mean, absolutely incredible. Um, this art competition was more popular than the, the art competition we've had for the duck stamp that, that has gone on for many, many years. We blew the duck stamp folks out of the water with the, the artwork we received. Um, lots of really cool different ways to engage with wildlife. That's what we're all about. Um, and with that, thanks for listening. And I'm sorry I went six minutes over, it looks like. Um, but if anybody wants to, to keep up with what we've got going on at Watchable Wildlife, there's always our from the field blog that you can subscribe to. Um, and I will, I thought I had my email address on here, but I'll put it in the chat because I don't see it. And with that, I will take any questions. Oh, great. Oh, I opened the chat box and the first thing I see is somebody who says they've been watching the Falcons for years. That makes me so happy. Let's see. I walked to Riverview Park in Radford several times a day, a week. Could you go back to sites in our area? Yes, we can definitely do that. Oh, and where are the elk? Um, the elk are uh, around uh, the Brakes Interstate Park area out in, in farther West Virginia, like Southwestern Virginia. Um, but we've got about 250 in, in the herd now. Um, so, and, and the elk camera, you can always see them there too, if, if you can't make it out to one of the, the sites at around Brakes. Um, and those elk viewing sites are also on the Virginia Bird and Wildlife Trail. Okay, so let's see the, the sites that you guys wanted to see. Um, let me pull up my chat again. The sites in your area. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm struggling with Zoom right now. I'm going to stop. Oh, no, you need to see the screen. Um, there it is. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here is the, um, I think I'm still sharing my screen. Yeah, here's the Eastern Continental Divide loop. So here's the list of sites. Um, and I will put a link to this in the chat box also. So you have that. And then we'll go back and look at uh, Lower New River. This is the one that has a lot of uh, a lot of water sites. So if you like kayaking or canoeing or just birding via the water, this is a great uh, a great loop. And my email address. Let me put that in here.
Okay, there are several places in the Continental Divide area that don't exist anymore or have different names as of about 15 years ago. Yes, so that is a perfect example of why this project is so, so necessary. Um, we used to have three watchable wildlife biologists. One covered the mountains and he retired probably about 15 years ago and his position was never replaced. They replaced our two coastal ones, but not him. So the mountains especially are, is, are it's really, really neglected. Um, and so this would be a, a, a great way that we could get that information updated. We could remove all those old sites. If you guys have recommendations for new sites, we could get those added in. Um, do we sign up as a group for the adopt a trail? Um, so yeah, the way adopt a trail works with chapters is you have a uh, you guys would designate an adopt a trail coordinator. So I would leave that up to your chapter to figure out who would be the project coordinator, um, and then I would work with that coordinator to get you guys launched and up off the ground where the data sheets are, do all the additional training stuff, um, and then that coordinator would send out a request for volunteers to your chapter and, and then you guys would volunteer to participate in that particular project if it's something that you are interested in. Do we have any other questions either by chat or um, or uh, you guys could unmute too if you've got questions and ask me in person. Oh, that's so great. I love that. I those early birder backpacks were great. And actually, um, the guide that we ended up using is a, the guide that Ned Brinkley, who is a very famous birder who recently passed away. Um, he's the one who produced that guide. And that's the one that's now being used in those early birder backpacks. So that makes me very happy too that Ned's guide is being used in them. <laughs> How about the other chart? Can you show the other location? Um, yes. Here's Eastern Continental Divide. How many of these sites are out of date? <laughs> they all look good. Oh, do they? Okay. Well, and we can see too what um, what one of them, their site pages actually look like. Pretty basic. No bird observations or anything like that, but. There's no yeah. longer the Virginia Tech Museum of Natural History. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Trust me. Okay, so yeah, so <laughs> that one would need to go too. How about Deerfield Trail? Yep. yep. Bird it all the time. Do you? Yeah, well, see, like, we can have all your bird observations. It's bird, well, I mean, it's birded by many of the local birders all the time. Mm -hmm. all, I think all of those, Deerfield is, Glen Alton, there are lots and lots of eBird lists for all those places. But I guess yeah. they, they have to be, how do they get connected? Well, they should be connected. When, when we got that new eBird feature up there, um, our webmaster automatically did a thing where um, the hotspot would automatically be connected to the website, but I have discovered a handful of them that it didn't work for. So if, if these sites get birded a lot, I will go back and double check to make sure that it went through. It might just be that I need to put a little code in and then that will sync it. Um, and I will also say those bird, the eBird the e observations and that 10 most recently found, those, um, if there hasn't been any new observations submitted within 30 days, it goes, it goes away. So it looks like this basically. So if no one has birded it within the last 30 days, we wouldn't see anything. The bird club's headed there next Saturday to Glen Alton. Okay. And, and, and regular people regularly bird all those places. There are lots and lots of eBird lists. So you should get that easily. Yeah, yeah. We birded Plater Lake yesterday. State Park. And Deerfield again has lots of lots of Mountain Lake does all of them do Pandapas Pond. Yeah. Is it Park Riverview? Oh yeah. Okay, look, Trail. see so here. Yeah, we've got it on this one. This was for Mountain Lake. You've got your 10 most recent there. 
Wow, so you guys still have dark eyed juncos around. They left for me a long time ago. <laughs> they're up there, they're up at Mountain Lake all summer. They they nest there. That's a high altitude place. Ah, I see. I am very much a coastal person, but I'm working on it. I'm I'm getting <laughs> I'm actually gonna be in Southwest Virginia in about two weeks to go visit our elk areas, and that will be my first time in the Virginia mountains. So I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Megan. Are there any other questions before we move on? That was so interesting, overwhelming. Oh, that's great. Hopefully, I didn't I didn't overwhelm you too much. Um, I'm glad to hear that it seems like folks are interested in the Adapt to Trail project. Um, I would say, you know, just follow up with Mara because her and I have had some really initial conversations about it. Um, and, uh, and we can work to get you guys all started. Um, yeah. It sounds like it would be an easy fit since you're visiting most of these sites already. And um, yeah, that would be great. And I'm so, again, just so happy that we have a Falcon Cam fan on this call because it's, I love, I love doing the Falcon Cam. It's my favorite part of my job. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Yeah, no problem. You guys have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>